Hey there, thank you for joining us for our third Kellett Live. My name is Helen Orison and today I'm joined by Samantha Steed who is the head of our prep school here at Cowling Bay. Now Samantha joined us uh, this academic year after headships at leading schools in the UK and Dubai. So Samantha, thank you for joining us. Lovely to be here, thank you. Oh, welcome. So in past Kellett Live conversations we've talked about the last few years of school but now we're going right back to the beginning. So the early years are so important, so how can we make sure children thrive? By the way, if you have any questions, please do write them down in the comments and we'll get to, get to them at the end of our chat. But please remember that we can't comment on specific cases. So first of all, Samantha, I think yes. it's helpful if we define exactly what we mean by early years. Okay, uh, so the early years is a stage of a child's development between naught and five. Um, there are all sorts of different terminologies out there. In the UK, um, you might have heard of daycare, uh, this is when parents are working and they might put their child into a full day setting. Um, then uh, children might often go to a nursery year or a preschool. Um, usually that's age three to four. And then following that year, they enter the reception class. So here at Kellett, children will join us after their fourth birthday, uh, coming into uh, the reception class, uh, turning five. Rising five, is that what you Rising five, yes. Yeah. Okay, so you've got extensive experience, as we know, in primary education, but a particular passion for early years. So why is it so important? Well, uh, early years is an incredibly special time. Uh, children at their most receptive. Uh, if we take the, 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 the young brain, we know quite a lot now about the young brain. Um, we know that the, the connections that the, that the brain makes are probably at the most numerous during the ages of around three, four, five. Uh, so it's really important that the child is um, having as many different opportunities and stimulations uh, so they can really strengthen those connections. Um, also, for, for young children, their body is developing. They are uh, very aware of their, their physical body um, and beginning to understand their sense of space and balance and coordination. Um, and we really want to build on that, uh, taking the child through their gross motor skills, so that's their bigger movements, their balancing and their running um, and standing on one leg, uh, down to the fine motor skills where they're starting to work out what they can do uh, with, with, with fine pincer grips um, and then eventually, and certainly not too early, you know, sort of moving into uh, early sort of mark making. Okay. And it's time for parents to maybe yeah. separate a little. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, parents by now, I think, you know, they, they've done their, their bit. They, they, you know, they've given that child a really supportive start. Um, and, but now, you know, a lot of parents will be considering going back to work. Uh, this is the time for, for practitioners in school, specially trained early years professionals, to, to step in and to really begin to... I guess extend the, the child's view of themselves um, and, and their place in the world. When they're coming into a school, they may have been in quite a small group, a family group, maybe some extended friends. Um, but here, coming into a school, it's a time for them to explore new relationships, um, to begin to trust new adults. Uh, there's there's lots of theories around attachment, and we know. Young children start with maybe five key attachments, um, building on that is ten key attachments. But by the time a child is five, it's the right time for them to come in and, and to trust uh, and, and test out their, their relationship building skills, both with the staff and, and with their friends. Okay, great. So as a mother, you've been through this with your own children. Do you think things have changed? Infinitely, uh, yeah. My, my youngest child is twenty now, um, and I think you know when when my my children were young, we didn't have quite as many options. Um, most uh, most of us just went to the local uh, school, uh, you know, at the end of the road. Um, most of the children knew each other and grown up together. Um, obviously, there wasn't quite so much movement across the globe, so we went to one you know, traditional uh, setting. Um, my, I guess my view was that I, I just wanted my child to be happy uh, or happily occupied um, and that I would be given time to, to do what I needed to do. Uh, obviously the world is a, a, a different place. Um, we are faced with technology now, uh, so children are using technology from a much younger age. Uh, so we see children using their parents' iPhones, um, they're used to moving images, they're used to things happening very quickly. Uh, so we need to 
uh, really rethink uh, how early years looks. Um, again, if I go back to my younger children, uh, when they were younger, um, there wasn't the top-down pressure for formal education. Uh, I remember there was much more involvement in, in, in crafts and baking and gardening, certainly getting messy, being outdoors. Mm. Um, I don't remember um, being too caught up in whether they knew their phonics, their number bonds, um, mm. and, and I, I really didn't know which university they were going to from no. such a young age. <laughs> No Mandarin flashcards or anything? No, no flashcards. Those hadn't been invented. Yeah. Uh, that, I think that the, the, the flashcards and these, these new digitalized um, sort of preparation tools that are on the market now just weren't there. Um, and to be honest, my children have done absolutely fine without those. Good to know. Yeah. Well, I've read an article recently about protecting children from a formal approach. Yeah, uh, the, the early years goes in cycles. You know, we, we, one moment. One moment, you know, the, the, the regulators, the, the writers of policy are uh, emphasising the play-based approach, and then it's almost like they panic and think, oh, but then the children won't be ready for year one, they haven't done enough writing. Uh, so we get this top-down pressure, this, this formal approach to learning, where the children will be assessed whether or not they can write sentences, um, whether they're using capital letters and full stops. Um, but I would argue that that's just not necessary. Um, children really don't come into their own in terms of, of coping with a formal approach until around seven. Mm. So it's really important and, and certainly something we emphasise here at, at Kellogg that play is of paramount importance. Mm. That's really where the magic happens for young children. Okay, great. So today I've seen, and every Tuesday I think this month, a yeah. steady stream of little children come for a stay in play session, which yeah. is part of the application process here. Yes. Can you talk us through what happens in those sessions? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's, it's, it, Keller isn't a selective school. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're not looking for anything specific. We absolutely recognise that children are individuals and each child is going to come to us with their own set of experiences. I guess for us, it's about establishing um, some links for the child that are coming from home to this is going to be your school um, and what does it feel like in a school. Um, they'll have some play-based uh, activities and I guess we are wanting to engage the children a little bit in, in play, have a chance to get to meet them, uh, speak to the families. Um, it's certainly not a pass or fail mm. um, and you know just this week you know, we, we, we had uh, you know, a little girl who just wasn't really ready um, and she's going to come back in a couple of weeks. You know, we, we, we wouldn't want to make this a stressful uh, experience for the children. So you're not testing children on their times tables and <laughs> things like that? No, no. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's cute when the children come in and they can recite their 12 times table, but um, to be honest, that, that, that's, just a, uh, you know, that, that, that's just learning by rote, and there's, there's, there's no substance to that. Um, I think we'd be much happier if, if a child was able to hand us five cakes uh, from a pretend play party, uh, rather, rather than sort of just reciting, you know, numerous dinosaur names. Um, so yeah, I think we're looking for children who who are interested in play and mm -hmm. who are curious about the world around them, mm -hmm. and maybe they want to share with us some experiences that they're having from home. Okay, so it's probably more potential than performance, I guess you'd say. That's a really good way of putting it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're definitely looking for, for potential. Okay, great. So what are some ways do you think that parents can prepare their children for school? Okay, I think something that sticks with me is this mnemonic called Nestle. I think it was Christopher Ball uh, many, many years ago. Uh, he wrote Sure Start, um, and he, he was a, a fantastic advocate for early years. And Nestle uh, stands for nurture, exercise, stimulation, talk, love, and environment. So all together, that's really the best preparation a parent can give their child, nurturing their child, seeking out the best experiences for their child, putting them in a supportive uh, in environment, um, giving them love. Your children who are loved do very, very well and, and thrive. Um, children who have had a healthy lifestyle, that have been outdoors, have had exercise, um, maybe had some risky adventures, you know, um, got paddled out in, you know, with, with their dads in the boat, um, that, that sort of healthy exercise. 
is really important. And then stimulation. We know, you know, if we, we think back to some of those awful images in, in the Romanian orphanages of those children who were not stimulated um, and how those children failed to thrive and, and long-term damage was done uh, internally with their brains. Um, similarly, we can overstimulate our children. I, I can think of, uh, you know, when I go to airports, I'm always really surprised to see the area where children go to play before getting onto a flight, because often the carpets are swirly and bright primary colours, there are plastic toys everywhere, bright coloured apparatus. And my mind is thinking, these children are supposed to now go from this overly stimulating environment onto a very quiet flight. <laughs> and it will probably right. be a nightmare. Oh gosh, I haven't thought of it like that. That's why I <laughs> dropped my children off. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm thinking, surely airports should be pairing that back, this should be a quieter environment, this should be uh, just a softer, um, you know, maybe duller light, softer lighting, so that the children are beginning to unwind, ready for the flight, rather than us really overstimulating them with all this swirly carpet. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. So I, do, I don't know if it's specific to Hong Kong, but to me it feels like a lot of parents feel under pressure to sign up their children to extra activities or get the flashcards out. What would you say to reassure them that it's yeah. not necessary? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that's global. Um, you know, lots of my friends you know, who, who've been parents, um, you know, that pressure is real. Uh, it comes you know, from the dinner party chat and, uh, you know, what, what book level your child might be on, um, different rates of, of development. Um, I, I, I do try to give the message that children don't really come into their own until they're seven. If I had my way, early years would be from naught to seven. Um, I, I, I've got a, a great colleague, uh, Professor Pat Preeby, and she's done a huge amount of work in, in, in how year one should be part of the, the early years. So it, I understand parents panic. Um, I understand that, that feeling that your child might not be ready. Um, but in, you know, in 25 years of being involved in, in early years, I can honestly say there's no need. Um, children develop at very different rates and, and childhood is not a race. Uh, you know, we, we, it, it's the best time of a child's life and um, to race through it, for what purpose? You know, there is no evidence that suggests that a child that has a stronger start in, in their early life does better at later exams. Uh, you know, I've, I've explored this, I've, I've researched this. Mm. Um, you know, obviously, as I've talked about before, preparing in that offering children opportunities for communication, using extended families to tell stories, going on those outdoor adventures when we can, talking about what's around us. You know, if you're going to visit the hillsides and the hikes, you know, turn that into a mini project. What are you finding? Allow your child to use technology, to take a photograph, uh, bring that back, explore that photograph, perhaps research that photograph together. Um, perhaps prepare a few sentences that your child could talk about that at, at school. Um, but really we just want parents to be involved in normal home life preparations, cooking together, talking together. I would emphasize maybe turning off the phone for 10 minutes a day, really hard for all of us. Um, it's really difficult for us to let go of tech. But I, I do say to parents, if you could just put your phone away on silent for 10 minutes and give your child quality time to go into a communication friendly space, as I call it, somewhere where you can have a deep conversation with your child about a story and they can retell a story or in, in, you know, in the bathtub, mm. bringing in some jugs and some bowls and some spoons and creating a story. Um, that is such rich experiences for the child and goes far further than memory cards and flashcards where a child just loses interest. And it, to be honest, it doesn't stick. Okay. It's reassuring for us all. <laughs> yeah. all right, yeah. So when a child starts in reception and they join their classroom for the first time, what can they expect to see in that classroom? Uh, so at Kellett, we, we're very fortunate. We've got beautiful, big, bright classrooms here and, and we've got a covered area uh, where the children can come out of their classroom and explore. We tend to keep it quite muted, uh, so we, we don't have a huge amount of overly stimulating colour. We use light greens, light blues to try to keep that feeling of nature. 
we have a, a lot of plants, uh, a lot of greenery around because we find that that's quite calming for children. Uh, we have lamps, uh, soft lighting, twinkle lighting. Uh, we have communication friendly spaces like little wigwams, uh, little cozy areas. We also have accessible resources. So I uh, talk about differences from when my children were at school, everything was locked away and you know, the teacher would only get something out and put it on the top of the table. Uh, whereas here children have um, the autonomy to choose, <coughs> excuse me, um, so they can have open-ended resources so rather than it being quite a fixed outcome to what they, what they choose and what they play with, they're able to take things and, and create new learning opportunities from what's around them. Um, also, we're looking at the, the physical development as well. So we've got uh, different heights in our rooms so that the children can take some risks, climb a little bit higher than they might have done before. Um, and, and then I guess we've got all sorts of things that would perhaps provoke the imagination. So at the moment, we've got a bear cave so that uh, children, their topic at the moment is if we go down to the woods today. So lots of stories around uh, woods and gruffalo and bear hunt. So the children are, are having a great, uh, a great time reenacting um, the, 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 the gruffalo stories. Uh, and I know down on the other campus, they've got a pirate ship at the moment. Because they've been focusing on pirates and maps. Um, Sounds great. Yeah, Exciting. yeah. <laughs> it is, it is a, a, a lovely environment for, for the children to be in. I guess I should say, above all, um, it's safe. Mm. You know, we, it has to be safe. The children have to feel secure um, so that they trust their environment. And mm. once they feel comfortable, and this management team as well that oversees the curriculum development. Okay, fab. And I know, we all know, young children like to move <clears throat> around. Is that encouraged within the classroom as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always say, you know, we need to move with children. You know, uh, if they move, we move. Uh, our, I'm, I'm a big advocate of flexible spaces. So if the, if the space is preventing children to be uh, learning in the way that they want to move, uh, then I would, you know, we, we need to move that furniture. We need to shift things around. We need to create environments that give children that freedom to stretch and to move. Uh, we're, we're, again, here at Kellett, we're very fortunate because we have the great big sky pitch upstairs. So we've got bikes up there, climbing frames up there, we've got the big running track, um, the synthetic grass. So they've got plenty of opportunity to, to really um, run off some steam and develop their physical skills. And of course, we have specialist sport teaching here from reception as well. So specialist PE staff, we have two, um, and they're fantastic with our younger children. Um, and I guess when I go outside and I see children really stretching, really limbering up, um, having some quite, I guess, specialised ball skills and coordination um, activities, I know that all of that is far more important than that child sitting down with a pencil. Young children, we know um, that, in, in fact, the, the hand isn't fully formed until age seven either. So the tendons uh, between the bones um, don't fully form, uh, and, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not a medic, but uh, we know that those tendons aren't formed. So actually for children, the best time for them to really hold you know, a writing tool for a long period of time is, is, is six, seven. Now, obviously, some children will be physically ready before then, that's just genetics. Uh, but generally, we know that tendons in, in children's bodies, they're not fully formed. Mm -hmm. So our job is to, to, to think about that child as a whole physical and emotional being and make sure that everything we do at Kellett is supporting their growth and, 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 and ensuring that we're not speeding through those, mm -hmm. um, those, those milestones. There's no need to rush. No, no. <laughs> okay, so I, I believe that some parents might want their children to join in year one rather than reception. What would you say to them? Well, at Kellett, the, the start point is at reception. Uh, it's not possible to join here in year one. Um, there's, there's strong and compelling reasons for a, a reception year. It is an obvious time for socialisation. Children are ready to explore and build on their new relationships. The UK system does currently have a still fairly formal approach in year one. So for children to miss out on all of that rich play opportunity, I think is, is, is a shame. Um, I mean, that said, you know, we can look at our, our, our European um, 
uh, peers and, and see that, you know, perhaps in Finland where they might start school at age seven, mm. a fantastic system. I, I, you know, have no issues with that whatsoever. But we need to remember that those children are also, they're, they're at a, a kindergarten, you know, they're at a preschool before that, a high quality, low ratio, often outdoor learning um, environment. So when the children come in at seven, they're ready mm -hmm. physically, mentally and emotionally to cope with the rigours of formal education. Um, so sometimes I think we get confused and parents hear the message that well, some countries don't start school until seven. Well, yes, that's a formal approach mm -hmm. and that's not too dissimilar to what would be happening at Kellogg that that reception year is our opportunity to uh, allow the child to, de to develop their sense of self, to develop trusting relationships, to begin to use their voice and to communicate with one another um, so that when the, the sort of more rigorous, uh, and it's not too rigorous, but uh, the more formal approach, when that comes in year one, uh, the, the child is, is, is at the right point. They're ready. They're ready. Okay, fine. We've had lots of questions coming in already, so Great. perhaps we'll start with those. So a question from uh, Cheyenne. Can you tell us a bit about what the entry process is like and the wait list? I think there are rumours that it's very difficult to join. Uh, yeah. Can we join during the year or is it better to wait and join at the start of a new year? So maybe two different questions. Let's okay. start with the entry process. Okay, so with Kellett, uh, it's, it's on the wait list. So the earlier you put your name down on the list, um, the, the more likelihood is that you'll get invited into one of the selection uh, assessment and stay, stay and play, play sessions. Uh, yeah. sessions. Um, I would say to parents to put the child's name down at many different places. Go, initially, get your name down, first of all, um, then do your due diligence moving on from that point. So. It's a bit competitive in Hong Kong. You know, have five options, put your child's name down from birth, then do your due diligence mm -hmm. and start to look at the schools, what do they offer? Um, you know, Kellett's obviously got a fantastic reputation that's been in Hong Kong for a long time. I'm very proud to, to have joined the team. Um, but is it right for your child? Mm -hmm. You know, really look, look thoroughly about um, what does, your child need what would be the right setting for your child um, it's not as difficult as as as, uh, as all of that uh, as I said it's, it's non-selective but it is around getting your name down early okay so be be prepared yeah. all right and the second part of the question was what about is it better to join halfway through a year or wait until the beginning of the new academic year so I've moved on this position since I, I, this is my sixth year internationally. And in the UK, there's very little movement. You know, parents found their school, they lived in the, in the community. Um, my time in Dubai taught me that children are very resilient and they come and they go. You know, parents, um, very fluid jobs. Uh, you know, a lot of our parents here at Kellett work in high powered industries um, and can be asked to move and relocate at short notice. So actually part of our role is to build resilience in children so should they have to make that move we will prepare that child for that transition and similarly that would then open up a place so it might be likely that a child will join us mid-year and it again is for us to ensure that that moving in process that settling in process is handled very carefully uh, so that the child gets a, a great experience um, obviously coming in at the start of anything um, you know, you get the full induction process, uh, you get to come to all of the parent workshops that take place at the beginning of the year. Um, so that, that, that is, is obviously going to be the, the, the best point of entry. Um, but that said, uh, if, if, if things in, in life dictate that you're coming in mid-year, then we would support that. Yeah, yeah. the school's fully used to it. I yeah. Guess. yeah. Okay, brilliant. And another question, uh, this one's from Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. How many classes do we have per year? And what's the maximum capacity? Okay, uh, so it's different. For Kowloon Bay, we have two classes per year, and we have 22 children in each class. Um, then down in Pokfalam, they have a slightly bigger site, uh, so they have three classes at reception. So we have five form entry in total across Kellett. Okay, great. And uh, so he also asked, is there an entrance assessment? 
No, uh, there's no formal entrance uh, assessment. Uh, there's no tick sheets. Uh, there's no uh, exam to pass. Um, as I said earlier, we are firstly and foremost just want to meet the children because up until this point they're just a name um, on our waiting list. Um, we had a little girl that came in and sang us, you know, the whole repertoire of the Frozen songs. You know, and that's fabulous. We love that. You know, it was really engaging, great fun, and, and you know, and just meeting the children. Um, they, you know, after all, they're, they're our passion. Um, we don't want them under stress. We, 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 we don't want them to have to be practised or coached or tutored. Um, yeah, I've heard some stories where you know, parents feel that there's an exam and, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the criteria is to stand on one leg, so they practise for a long time <laughs> for the child to stand on one leg. Yeah. Um, so no, uh, we, we, we simply want to get to know the children. Um, and you know, if they have an accident on that day, it's okay. It's, it's, it, you know, that doesn't mean that they have failed the assessment. If they cry, they haven't failed the assessment. Um, you know, it is tricky to, to, to get into Kellogg. We don't, we only have two forms on, on this particular mm -hmm. campus. Um, and, you know, very, very occasionally we might come across a child who's just not yet ready. And it would be the wrong thing for them to come into an environment like Kellogg with so many children at the beginning of the term. And we will have those sensitive uh, conversations with parents. Okay, wonderful. So, um, a question from Jenny. Do you accept children who have come from Wardorf kindergarten? So they're very, they're purely play-based, aren't they? Yes. So they yeah. might not be as advanced academically or ready to school, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Steiner system um, is similar to the sort of Montessori system. Uh, they have a slightly different approach. They're still looking at stages of development. Uh, the, you know, it, it's. Um, all very important, very practical based uh, experiences. Those children often do very well coming into reception. I'd say uh, children coming from a Montessori or a Steiner uh, background do find it more challenging coming into year one. Right. That's because the UK reception class, if the child is ready, does pick up some rigour in the third term. So children who are ready will enter into some, some formal writing, some formal maths operation work um, and we do see a noticeable difference for those children who come in um, without that if, if there's an opportunity to, for them to come into the school at year one but certainly at reception um, they're absolutely fine. Okay yeah. great. Uh, a question from Jasmine, what is the earliest age a student can enter Kellett? So they have to have had their fourth birthday by the 1st of September. Um, any earlier than that and they would be classed I think as K1 internationally, kindergarten one, um, and would probably be in some sort of preschool kindergarten setting. So yeah, they, they need to have had their fourth birthday. Okay, great. And a question from Ken, a hot topic. A lot of schools are using technology earlier on. What's your take on screen time for the under fives? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. Thank you, Ken. Uh, for me, I, I mean, I, I, I actually love technology. Uh, I love innovation. Um, my time in Dubai and also now in, in Hong Kong has, has only really endorsed that. And for me, to stop children having technology just seems uh, it's, it's pointless. We, 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 we can't, <laughs> not as parents and not as teachers. So what do we do? We, we look at recommended guidance. We look to the professionals um, and they tell us currently that the maximum amount of screen time for a five-year-old is one hour. So if you think that's TV time, any screen time at school, phones, um, you know, allowing your child to, to look at the phone whilst you do the supermarket shop, we know it's a great tool to keep them occupied, but that does count as screen time. So one hour is the, the recommended guidance. Uh, it goes to two hours by the time the child is eight and so on. But we need to think about visual. Uh, we, we, you know, we don't know yet the impact of screen time on the eyesight and auditory processing. Um, I could, I could take a guess that I, I think children's eyesight would be compromised. Mm. Uh, we may see more children, uh, you know, needing to wear glasses from an earlier age. Um, I would suggest that uh, children's processing um, may may be impaired the children are having to process perhaps the parent talking to them whilst looking at a phone 
Uh, you can often find children who perhaps are being fed their food or eating themselves, but with a screen in front of them. So this is a huge amount of stimulation, um, and it does mean that the child's not able to fully focus on concreting one set of inputs. Um, so I think we'll see, you know, as time goes on, I think we will, we will see that too much tech can have a, a negative impact. Mm -hmm. That said, um, what we can do with iPads in schools now um, for uh, enhancing learning is, 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 is brilliant. And I've seen some fabulous examples of the reception children filming themselves, retelling the bear hunt story. I'll go back to the bear hunt, one of my <laughs> favorites. Um, posting images for their parents on, on Seesaw. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of tech, but we just need to keep a check mm. on it. Tech in the right way, I guess. Yeah. Okay. A question from Amy. What are the differences between reception at, Co at Pokfulam and Kowloon Bay? Are there any differences? And how do we allocate places? Okay, so there the, are no obvious differences. Uh, the, the team plan together. We have a phase leader for reception here and a phase leader at Pokfulam. Um, in fact, with, with uh, the deputy head there and myself, we've just done a, an early years review where we have review the curriculum, the assessment, because the UK uh, created the new framework for early years, so we wanted to review our curriculum against that. Um, so we did that as a full team, and then we looked at our environments to make sure that it was supporting uh, every, every uh, area of learning. Um, so I'd say they're pretty comparable. Um, we're not tied to the children doing exactly the same topics at exactly the same time, but the outcomes should be the same. Now, in terms of um, allocating the places, it tends to come down to location. Right. I think, you know, if, if a parent lives on the island, they nearly always would, would, would end up moving to the Pokfulam campus. Um, that said, uh, you know, I've got, uh, I've got families uh, who live in my block uh, over on the island who come to this school. Um, but I think, you know, have those conversations with the admissions department. Mm. Okay. Yes, if you need to contact our admissions department, all the details are on the website. Okay, uh, so from a question from Shana. Thank you, Shana. How do children fare at Kelly if they haven't been or experienced any formal education before? Does that ever happen now? So formal education mm. or just a preschool? As in nursery. no pre-nursery, no K1. Okay, so then that puts quite a lot of pressure on what the parents have provided. Now, if you've been a motivated parent and you've had huge amounts of life experiences with your child and, and back when holidays were a thing <laughs> you've been to mountains you've been you know on, on lakes um, and you've been immersed perhaps in countries with different languages and you've tried different foods who am I to say that that isn't rich um, and, and, and appropriate um, if you've been able to provide that as, as a family then great I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain the child would be absolutely fine coming into Kellett. Uh, you know, conversely, if you haven't been out much, been in your apartment, you've perhaps had you know your your, your helper um, and and not many other experiences, I think it it, it may it may notice coming into an environment. I think the child may find it difficult to make new attachments and to make new relationships. Um, and I think you know communication skills may be uh, just at, a, at an earlier stage than some of the children who've been out there mm -hmm. and have built trusting relationships with other children. And you know, <laughs> children don't always play nicely together. <laughs> you know, they, they they test the boundaries. They they learn about sharing and about you know what's right and what's wrong. Um, so you know, a child that's been mostly with their parent may not have, have, have garnered those skills mm. in quite the same way than when you're one of 20 in a preschool and there's only two bikes. You've got to develop those negotiating skills and who's going to get the bike and for how long and when is it going to be my turn and how long do I have to wait? Um, you know, if you haven't had those sorts of experiences, it's going to come as quite a shock That's when so you're shock. tenth in line for the, for, you know, for the ride on toys. <laughs> Okay, great. So uh, a question from Dom. I think you mentioned it's not possible to join in with year one, and I think you mean as part of the sort of formal yes, formal yeah. admissions we start yes. in reception. Yeah. But So the question was, do we accept a child joining in year one at all? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If, if, the, if a place come, comes available, and I, I think as I mentioned earlier, you know, international 
internationally in the world, it's very transient um, and, and families, you know, do have to move through work reasons or, or, or maybe have to go back to their home countries. So, you know, occasional places do come up. Um, so there's a wait list for year one. So uh, if children are somewhere else in the reception year, but looking to move into Calais at a later point, then um, make sure that that's known to admissions um, and, and be on, on the waiting list. And then as those occasional places come up, um, we would be inviting the children to, to come in and meet us Obviously, the older the child is, um, there is a little bit more rigor to the uh, to the selection process, just to make sure that the, the, the child would be able to, to to have a you know a happy and fulfilling time at Callet and, and settle in well. Right. Yep. So we've got rolling admissions, and actually, Dong, this may be of interest to you. Our next um, Facebook Live will be all about admissions, so please like our Facebook page to um, make sure you don't miss that. Okay. And now a question from Manasi. How do you promote diversity in the classroom? I've just seen all the Diwali uh, <laughs> celebrations. Yes, yeah, so it's a good timing of this question. We had Diwali celebrations yesterday. Uh, you know, we have a very diverse community, uh, you know, multiple languages and cultures. Uh, we have a positively colored framework and part of that framework is global outlook. Um, and I did an assembly yesterday and I said to children, you know, what do we mean by a, a global outlook? Um, you know, and, and the responses were that we need to think about everybody that, that is in our world and respect the differences that we have. Um, and then we talked about an enlightened approach and what did it mean to have an enlightened approach? And so, you know, for us to understand that different cultures celebrate different things at different times and that everybody can join in and, and be part of those those celebrations. Um, I, I we, we have a, a fabulous community here, uh, and similarly, when I was in Dubai, um, I think one of the, the key, uh, it's not really success, but I guess a, a privilege uh, for, for me and for our students is that being an, in an international setting, we meet such a huge range of interesting people whose backgrounds are just remarkable um, in terms of where their home lives were, what, what family travels they've had, uh, and the stories that they can tell. Um, so it's a very rich culture here. Mm. Okay. Great. And uh, also about diversity, a question from Sandeep. What do we do to promote or inclusivity? What about LGBT families? Of course, uh, yeah, very, very welcome. Um, that we, 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 of course, we have families, um, same-sex families. Um, not that that's really any of our business or, or it's it's just taken as you know parents are parents here um, I, I, I guess our community would be able to answer that better than me I hope that they feel that there are no barriers to being um, you know to be to being a callet um, I, I hope we come across as inclusive um, certainly in the last 10 years of, of my leadership I really haven't given it an awful lot of thought it's just what we do um, we you know we have children now who, you know, will have very, very diverse parenting situations at home, um, and they're, that's all respected. Um, some parents will tell us the, the history um, of their family and, 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 and what, what sort of the di what the dynamics are in their own family, and, and, and want that to be um, really embraced and, and celebrated. Uh, other families feel that that isn't something they really want to to share or highlight and. Um, and that's that also fine. Okay, great. Everybody's welcome. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, uh, a question from Jennifer about Mandarin. Mm -hmm. How much exposure is there in reception? Yeah, so great time to learn languages. So uh, go back to the brain. Um, you know, children that learn languages age three up, um, that's when it really sticks. So I mean, I'm, I'll put my hands up, I'm hopeless at learning languages. I, I grew up in a very small town in, in, in the UK and I didn't come across other languages. Uh, I think it was secondary school before I found out about French. Um, whereas the children here, Kellett, they have three lessons of Mandarin per week. So they become quite quickly That's immersed. in reception. In reception, yeah. Um, and then uh, we, you know, we're, we're hoping to keep strengthening our Mandarin provision. There are Mandarin after school classes as well. Uh, as, as like um, additional learning, if you like, or extended program learning. 
Um, I would say with languages, though, it does rely heavily on the parents. There's only so much we can do in school. You know, we're a British curriculum school at the end of the day, so we have to fit in the, the UK curriculum. Um, but we do value our, our languages program. Um, but it does rely on the parents exposing the child to that language. So you know, if, you, if you've got, uh, you know, parents, one French, one British, almost certainly one of those parents, the French will be speaking in French and then the English parent will speak in English and that child just naturally picks up both languages. Whereas if you've got a reception class child, um, neither parent speaks Mandarin, three lessons a week is a starting point. Um, but it, it, it will need to be, uh, I think, added to uh, if, if, if you wanted a very thorough uh, Mandarin experience. Okay, great. So perhaps um, we could talk about what would be a typical day for a reception child? Okay, well, there isn't one. No. <laughs> um, we, 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 we have a timetable, but we also have some flexibility around that. Uh, they, they, you know, they are our youngest year group. So, but, you know, I guess if we look at it, we, uh, the children come in and they have play. So the first thing they do is to play. They, 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 they don't want to sit on the carpet. They, they, they've been in bed all, all evening. They've been up. They're ready to come into school. Uh, so play is the first thing that they'll do. Some outside play and then coming inside. Uh, and that just re-cements relationships that they've been making the day before. Um, then there'll be some phonics learning. So there'll be lots of different activities set up to um, start the phonics journey. Um, you know, we're looking at five phonic sounds to start with, maybe then building up to 10. But there will be some children who can put small words together, so they might work in a, a different group. Um, there'll be some specialist lessons, so we'll have a specialist music class, a specialist sport lesson, Mandarin will, will be there. They come into the library, where we are now, uh, for a session with our librarian. Um, but lots and lots of play, lots of opportunities for retelling those stories, um, communicating with their friends, lots of craft, lots of making, um, baking, uh, getting creative. The art studio, I think, is my favourite place to go and yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, we're obviously still in the middle of a pandemic. It's been a difficult time for everyone, for students and teachers and parents. Have you noticed any particular changes with um, children coming into school? Yes, I mean, the, the obvious one, the, you know, they're wearing masks. A lot of these children have been wearing masks for half their life now. So, you know, I'm not sure that you know, children, I don't think can remember a time when they didn't wear a mask. So that is having an impact on children's oracy. Um, that I don't think that they're communicating as readily uh, as, they, as I've known children of this age to do so in previous years. So we're working on really having communication rich environments, communication rich activities to really in, um, in, embed sort of the vocabulary and, and bringing children slightly out of their shell a little bit and, and, and talking more. Um, we've noticed as well uh, some physical development. Uh, children haven't had quite the same opportunities for the, the dance classes, the, 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 the swimming classes, all of those clubs that the children would go two, four, you know, three, four years old, they, they haven't had those experiences. So I think we're seeing we, we, less so now, we've been here, you know, a good half term now. Um, but at the beginning, we were seeing quieter children who were much more still <laughs> than we were used to. So we're saying, right, you know, let's let's get that, that, that child spirit back again. Let's, let's get some, some risky play. Let's get some messy play. Um, let's get their excitement levels up again. Um, academically, less so. Um, parents did a great job. Um, well done, parents. <laughs> yeah, you know, parents did a great job. You know, they, 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 we have children that actually can do quite a lot of their mathematical skills. Um, you know, we really did have a child that could recite the 12 times table. Um, but, you know, actually what we want is that child to be able to play and, and, and understand the concept of number. Um, as I said, you know, what are five current buns? Could you give me three of your five current buns? How many do you have left? Wouldn't be something that that child could have uh, could have answered. So whilst they've got quite a lot of rote learning, um, and, and that's been quite helpful in terms of the learning to read, um, we need to um, provide much more opportunity for communication, curiosity, exploration, um, testing, you know, experimenting. Okay. 
right. And we've had a question in from Andy. Okay. Are there any parent participation events during the school year? And what are the school's expectations of parents? Okay, uh, so yeah, parent, parent events. We recently had a reading workshop, um, which I led, and parents were asked to be involved. Um, I put them in the position of, of being a child learning to read. Uh, so we had quite a lot of fun with that. Uh, so parents actually got to feel what it was like um, going through that process. Um, we then asked the parents to come and stay and, and play. So they came into the environment and, 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 and played alongside their children. Again, uh, as I said earlier, you know, some parents haven't had experience of play. Uh, they, they haven't had that experience themselves as a child and certainly not in, in their own school. So uh, having the parents coming in and, and experiencing what their children are experiencing, uh, I think it was a relief for some parents to say, okay, now I know what they do all day. Because the average child won't say, no, I didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, um, so for us to be able to invite parents in um, was fab. You know, we, we haven't been able to do it. The school's been closed. Um, so, and then there's, we've got year one uh, next week, similar um, experience. And then we want to have, you know, grandparents to tea and dad's day and all sorts of things. Um, expectations of parents, uh, I've been a working parent forever, so I understand that parents' time is, is precious. So as much as you can be involved, fabulous. Um, there are different forums for that. You can be a class rep if you've got lots of time. Um, you can offer to help at events uh, if you can just do a couple of evenings. Um, the best thing that a parent can do, as I said, is give 10 minutes quality time a day to, to, to their children. That 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 is enough. Um, looking looking through the book bag, having a look at the seesaw, um, staying in regular communication with the school, um, then that, that, that is brilliant. Everything on top of that is a bonus. Okay, great. And now the school assemblies, aren't there? So parents can yes. come in for those? Yep. Um, the receptions start off with their Christmas show. Oh. Um, that's their, their first performance. Um, so we're looking forward to that one. <laughs> oh, that's, they're always lovely to see, aren't yeah. they? All right, great. I think we're almost out of time, so one okay. more question. Good. How important is it for children to get a positive school experience early on? Oh, I, you know, if you can get it right from the start, the, the rest falls into place. Um, you know, really right, right from birth, uh, have, having those, those nestle conditions for children, um, then carefully choosing a school that suits your family um, and, and su you know, suits your child. It's a happy starting experience. Uh, you know, it's fair to say not all children settle straight away, and that's also okay. Uh, you know, we ch children take different uh, amounts of time to actually settle into school, um, but I, I, it's fundamental to to, to their, their their future success. Um, I've been an advocate for early years for as long as I can remember, um, because I, I just feel that everything that the child builds on um, starts with with the, the firmest of foundations at, at reception. So for me, of course, it's hugely important yeah brilliant well so interesting thank you unfortunately we've yeah. run out of time for today okay. but do make sure you like us on facebook to keep up to date with future events as i said the next facebook live will be on admissions hot topic and if there are any other particular topics you'd like us to talk about you can always send us an email and we'll try and get to them so thank you very much samantha for joining Thanks, us Helena. and thank you thank you yeah.